Hello and welcome to my convolutional neural network in its uh, simplest imaginable form in uh, PyQt Python. This GUI is to a large extent built in a GUI that I uh, used in a previous video, so you might want to check that out first. Uh, you can see the link. So this is the simplest possible conv architecture I could think of. And before I start going through it, for your information, I'm purposely avoiding certain design choices and concepts from the beginning, so be aware of that. It's going to come later. So what's different from the normal ANN that I uh, did in the previous video? Well, first, uh, I'm using fewer hidden neurons here. There's only two instead of three or four in the last video. And uh, also, the, there's three inputs instead of two, and they are also connected with these uh, like black lines that I drew. And that's uh, a requirement for a convolutional neural network to work well, is that there is uh, some local connectedness in the data, so that this input has more in common with this input rather than this input. I also changed the synapses, so, th so uh, there are no predefined connections here, but rather uh, the connections are made um, on the fly when we see a certain part of the image. So either they can be connected uh, this way when we put a filter over this part of the image and then this uh, neuron is activated we can see that these connections are made or uh, the other case is this when uh, the filter is here then the connections are made this way so that uh, uh, this neuron is activated and um, we can think of these two red dots as our eyes uh, so uh, this eye is looking to to the bottom side of the filter and this eye is looking to the top side of the filter so uh, that's how the connections are made and the biases are connected to everything just as before one pretty scary thing to note here is that we have many inputs and not so many neurons to handle the inputs so the complexity of our brain here or model is smaller than the real world out there it's like an analogy for how we humans and uh, other organisms uh, deal with our situations. So we're stuck with our two neurons and uh, we somehow decided that each of these two neurons is capable of analyzing two inputs that are next to each other at a time. So we get this filter and we, we can then slide this filter or convolve it over our whole input um, in a stepwise fashion to uh, pr make the propagation of signals as uh, simple for our brain to deal with as possible. A couple of key CNN uh, concepts which takes a while to wrap your head around which, and are worth repeating is that this neuron doesn't in any way represent this eye. Um, actually it's not like an eye, it's more like a connector or a neurotransmitter or something. Um, this neuron cares about the information retrieved when the filter is lying on this location. So it's a bit confusing here because we have only two filter locations in this uh, case uh, but uh, we also have a filter size of two. Uh, but this neuron doesn't care about the filter size, it only cares about uh, the filter location. And another weird thing to note is that um, we have only two signals uh, at any time here but there are two pairs of synapses back here and that the weights between them are shared so we can see that this, these values don't change when we switch the filter location um, so if I'd been less lazy I would have actually drawn out the, um, the thickness of these lines to represent this number so we can think of this line and this line as having thickness 10 and this line um, and this line having thickness 7 and there's also one bias for each filter location. Before I'm going to dive into the forward prop and back prop procedures, uh, let's take a look at the data I'm going to work with. So I changed the number of inputs from uh, 2 in the previous case when we solved the XOR gate using a normal ANN to 3 because um, I think 3 is the minimum inputs needed to build a data set for which it would make sense to use a convnet. And this is usually not what you see in deep learning tutorials. They usually throw something way more complicated at you. So we have three inputs, and we want the network to output a 1 when we have uh, two ones next to each other. <coughs> uh, this uh, looks really simple, but we can think of this as representing something more complicated. Let's imagine that this uh, data set uh, represents images, and this is the left, this is the middle, and this is the right of the image. And we're looking for cats in these images. And whenever we have a 1, we have a cat feature. 
and a cat is uh, two cat features next to each other. So here we have a cat and uh, here we don't have enough cat and uh, here we have enough cat features but uh, they're not connected so it's like cat with hole uh, so it's not a cat. And here we have too much cat uh, it's like a deep dream cat monster with cat everywhere and um, it should not be a cat but this actually represents a pretty interesting case and uh, problem for deep learning uh, because because we, we it's hard to build an algorithm which actually spits out an, uh, a zero here and uh, some humans would would classify this as a cat but I, I would say that this is more like a, what the heck is this uh, cat monster kind of thing even if we take away this data row um, our convenient in its current form is not going to be capable of solving this uh, problem and I was considering changing the convenient architecture to make it capable of doing it but uh, I think it's really meaningful to walk through why it doesn't work in this case. But let's first go through a whole uh, forward prop and back prop cycle. And uh, I'm not going to do that for this uh, date row because it's kind of boring, nothing happening. So I'm going to do it for this row. And I'm also going to set all weights equal to 1 to make it easier to follow. So we'll load this data row, 0, 0, 1. And uh, then we'll place the filter over the top here. and. Uh, we're going to for propagate to this new row now by taking this one times this one plus this one times this one plus uh, this one times this one. So it's a dot product as the input here. And then we we'll run this input through the activation function which is the sigmoid to get the, get the output from this new run. And then we do the exact same thing for the other filter location here to get the output here. And now we're done with this convolutional layer and uh, then we can proceed to our dense layer which is over here. And uh, here the forward propagation works just the same as in the normal ANN. So we get our uh, dot product here and we run it through the activation function to get the output. And now we're going to calculate the, uh, the error here. So we take the expected value minus the output to get the delta. And then we square this delta to get the MSC, the mean squared error. And then we take the delta and multiply it with the derivative of this output to get the delta gradient. So we're like moving to the other side of this neuron here. In the previous video I had the delta gradient placed here but since we are on the left side here we're, it's better here. So now we're going to back propagate and uh, over here in our uh, dense layer the back propagation works just as in a normal ANN so uh, when we're going to calculate the delta weight of this synapse we're going to take the delta gradient and multiply it with the output here. So we can see here that uh, delta weight of uh, this synapse is bigger than for this one because the output is bigger here. And uh, for the um, bias uh, synapse the delta weight is the same as the delta gradient here because the output here is uh, always 1. So now we're going to back propagate uh, to the convolutional layer over here. And it's going to be in a stepwise fashion because we have two filter locations. Uh, so we begin by placing the filter over the first location. And now we're going to back propagate to, to calculate the delta weights over these two synapses with regard to this neuron because this neuron has been responsible for the propagation of signals uh, with regard to this filter location. So uh, for both of these synapse weights we're going to begin by taking the delta gradient, uh, delta ga gradient uh, multiply with the, the weight over here times that with the activation function derivative of this output and then uh, multiply it uh, with the corresponding output here. Uh, so since both of these outputs are zero, both of these delta weights are going to be zero. But we're not done here. Uh, we're going to store uh, the delta weight values for these two synapses now and then place the filter over the next location and calculate the uh, uh, delta weights with regard to this filter location and this neuron. So we're going to take the delta gradient, go down this path now and get some new delta weight values and we're going to add these two delta weight values to the old ones we stored from the previous filter location and uh, unfortunately uh, both of the outputs were zero here so we're actually not storing anything other than zero so it's kind of boring but um, we can see here that the uh, delta weight for this synapse is uh, still zero because both the connections uh, here were, were all, always ended up being zero because the outputs were uh, were zero. So uh, the bias uh, delta weights uh, here it's going to be exactly the same as uh, this delta weight because all the values here are the same and uh, these values are calculated the exact same way as for, for 
for these ones it's just that the, there's always a one here and um, this value is actually bigger than this one uh, unsigned and you might wonder why that is because this this uh, neuron here has uh, a bigger input and a bigger output than uh, this neuron so why is the network saying to a neuron with a bigger output that it should be punished less for for the error than uh, um, uh, a neuron with a smaller input and output. And we're using the sigmoid function here. So the sigmoid function derivative peaks at 0 0.5 and then it levels off when it goes towards uh, 1. And I don't really get the intuition for that. I, I think it might have something to do with that. We, th we assume that uh, neurons with a weak input are not expected to have like stabilized or converged on something. So they need to learn more and therefore they should be punished more. But if we would have used the ReLU function, which is normally used for CNNs, um, then uh, both the derivatives here would have been 1. So uh, then these values would have been the same. Now when we're done with one of these cycles, we're going to update the weights just as in a normal CNN, either with the pattern learning or a batch learning. And I'm going to do pattern learning now so we can see the weights updating immediately now. And then we we'll load the next uh, data row, and it's going to be 110. And uh, I'm taking them from uh, this mock uh, data set that I'm just uh, using to show you how this works. So we uh, run through the whole cycle again. And now we can see that the output is smaller than the expected values. So we're going to get uh, positive delta weights in the dense layer here uh, for all the synapses. Uh, but the batch delta weight is still negative, and that's because uh, the last data row uh, we had the opposite uh, thing going on here, and uh, the difference between uh, the output and expected value uh, for that data row was much bigger. So that's why the net here is uh, negative. Uh, this is the iterative mean of all old uh, delta weights and the new one. Let's backpropagate again now. So we place the filter over here, and um, we're going to get the same uh, positive delta weight values here because uh, the outputs are the same. And then we place the filter over the next location. And since the output here is zero, we're not going to see a change to this delta weight, uh, whereas this one should uh, become bigger. So this one is almost twice as big as this one now. Mm -hmm. 